All right, um, spiritual parenting Bible study for today. And this is what's next, I believe, part four. <laughs> so hopefully I don't get those confused. I'll have to start double checking, but uh, let's pray and then we'll get into the Bible study. Lord, I thank you for who you are, as you are awesome. Lord, I ask that you just move in your way and help me to get out of the way today, God. And if, if somebody needs to hear this, help them understand it and help them apply it to their lives. Because if they don't, God, it doesn't do them any good. So this is your time, and we give it to you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so the past, uh, I guess, three, four weeks, we've went over what's next. And what that means is what's next after you have given your heart to Jesus and you've said yes to him. Um, now that we're going to start with uh, more verses today in Isaiah chapter 55. So if you have your Bibles, and I highly recommend that you do this. Get your Bible out. And turn to these actual scriptures and read them because the more that you get into your Bible and the more you read it you're not just taking my word for it you're getting in there and you're digging into it and you're learning it on your own um, I use this analogy all the time where if you get in the shower and you take a shower and you let the water run all over you, but you don't use any soap or shampoo or body wash or anything, you're gonna still stink. So you need to use soap, you need to use shampoo, body wash, whatever. Something to clean you off and get the yuck off. And when you open up your Bible and you read it, you can read it, but if you don't apply it, in here and in here it didn't do you any good so get to a point where when you have your time with the lord you open it up and you read it and you apply it to your life okay and if you have questions about that and you're like sarah i don't really know how um i'm more than willing to talk to you about that i've got some videos on my youtube page that actually talks about that and it should be on this this wall too with spiritual parenting okay um, if you don't know where it is I'll just repost it so that you can see it and I think it's only like about a three minute blurb but it's pretty specific on what to do and how to do it. how to understand reading the word when you're reading it <clears throat> excuse me okay so Isaiah chapter 55 it's in the Old Testament and it is right behind Proverbs okay or I'm sorry it is not it is right behind let me double check here sometimes I forget Song of Solomon or Song of Songs Ecclesiastes then Proverbs okay so Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 where is it let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Okay, let me read it again. Let the wicked forsake his way and let the evil man his thoughts. And the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Okay, so what is this verse actually mean because i know a lot of times you open up the bible and you read something and you go hmm i don't get it i i do it all the time but if you ask the lord to give you wisdom and help you with it he will let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts let him turn to the lord and he will have mercy on him and to our god for he will freely pardon this literally means if we quit doing our wicked ways and turn to God, he'll pardon us. He'll forgive us. That's what this means, okay? But you have to turn to God and you have to quit doing 
the wicked things, the evil things and the evil thoughts. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, now we're going to go to read Psalm 103.12. Okay, so Psalms is before this, so we're going to go back. Psalms 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's cool. As far as the east is from the west, so how far is the east from the west? It, it doesn't really stop, I guess, if you think about it. It goes on and on and on and on. He has removed our transgressions from us, and transgressions would be sins. That's what that means. <clears throat> so what does God do with your sins when he forgives you? He removes them. Bye bye. They're gone. That's what that means. As far as it as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's good. That's good stuff right there. Okay. Micah seven nineteen. Wonder what this means. Okay, Micah is back towards the back of the Old Testament. Way back here in the back. So we're going to go to Micah. There's Malachi, then Zechariah, <clears throat> then Haggai, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum, and Micah. Okay, so Micah chapter 7, verse 19. What has that got to do with things here? Where'd it go? <clears throat> This is right. Let's see. Micah 719. There we go. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think that's getting at? <clears throat> What does God do with your sins when he forgives you? Micah 7, 19 is another one. You will again have compassion on us. So he has compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot. Let's trample on them. Stomp on them. And hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. He just gets rid of them. When we ask for forgiveness, he throws them away. That is really that simple. You're probably thinking, well, how's it? it's that simple. It's what it says. He just gets rid of them. <laughs> Treads our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I think that's cool. Okay, since God is just, how can he let you off without paying the death penalty for your sin? Have you ever thought about that? Since God is just, how can he let you off without paying the death penalty for your sin? This might surprise you, but it's a really cool answer. It's the whole point, really. <clears throat> okay, so let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21 to answer this. And we're going to go back to the New Testament towards the back. Okay. I'm too far. Hang on. Second Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 5, verse 21. All right. Verse 21. Okay. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus came for us. That's one of the reasons, That's well, that's the thing. Christmas, we celebrate Christmas because Jesus came and was born as a human person that was perfect and had no sin and became the ultimate sacrifice for us for Easter with the crucifixion and the resurrection, okay? So that's where that part comes in. But this verse specifically says, 
God made him, meaning Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was the sacrifice for us, is the sacrifice for us because he's still with us and lives among us and dwells, with us, dwells among us. Jesus became the perfect sacrifice and he took our sin away when he died, when he was crucified. And he is the one that paid the price for all of our sins. Okay? The reality is you just have to believe that. If you believe that, then you are paid in full. Okay? If you don't believe that, you are in trouble. It is that simple. Because it's true. It's what happened. He came. He literally was born to die for us. And I don't want to get in to too much because I'll start to cry. I, I can't. My emotions get the best of me when I think about what he did. Because you know what? I didn't deserve it and neither did you. But he loved us enough to do it for us. And that is... I will never ever be able to thank him enough. Okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> uh. Okay, so how can he let you off without paying the death penalty for your sin? Because he knew that we couldn't do it. He knew that within our power we couldn't do it. So he did it for us. He paid the ultimate price of not just death, but being tortured mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. He literally went to hell for us and took what he had to take in order to be the one that says, okay, this person goes to hell, that person doesn't. This person goes to heaven, that person doesn't. He is the judge. God is the judge. It's his decision. But he paid that price for us. I want you to get that. You can't do anything to take away your sin. You have to ask Jesus to take it away. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He did it for us. You just have to say, please take away my sin. Forgive me. Confess it with your mouth. And believe that he is who he says he is. And he will do it. So cool. All right. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was our substitute. He became our sin sacrifice, and he paid the price of death for us. It is that simple. Okay. What illustration did Jesus use in Revelation 3.20 to show us how easy it is to accept him? Ooh, this is good. This is something I would do with the kids. Okay. Revelation's a very, very last book. Revelation 3. Verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus talking, okay? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It is that simple. You open the door. You say, come in, Jesus. And he will literally come in and, uh, and, and be with you. Abide with you is what the word says. It's that simple. It's not complicated. You just have to believe it. So open up the door of your heart and say, Lord, come in. Okay? Okay. If Christ is to come into your heart, who must open the door? You must. You must open the door for him to come in. Okay? Your mom can't do it. Your grandma can't do it. You. Just you. It's between you and him. You and him. Okay? All right. When Jesus comes into your heart, what gift do you have immediately? So let's go to 1 John chapter 5. It's just a few books back. Literally. It's only a couple 
pages to turn. First John chapter five, I went too far actually. 11 through 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Okay. So it's eternal life. So what gift do you have immediately? As soon as you accept Jesus, eternal life. Okay? When you move, and I don't know how it works, only God does, and he's the only one that can move us from earth to the heavenly realm when we take our last breath, when we pass away or die. But he is the one that gives us the eternal life. And so when you, when you finally pass away, whenever that day comes, if you've accepted Christ and you... You know, he's the one you chose. Then you will go to heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. That's how it works. Okay, let me go to the next page. We'll be done here just a little bit. So. All right. Where am I at now on this one? Try to make sure I stay close to my notes. I'm not drift off too far. John 3, 16, verse, through verse 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish or die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the wor world through him. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Okay, so that's how we know that we have, we get eternal life when we ask Jesus into our hearts. Okay, uh, Luke chapter 23 are going to help us answer two questions. Okay, the questions are, are the thieves that are in these verses worthy of heaven? And how many good works do you have to get done in order to be ready to go with Christ? Good questions. And we're going to answer these. Now, if you didn't know this and you're learning this for the first time, then make sure that you're teaching it to someone else. Okay? All right. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, verse, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 23. I'm getting there. Hang on. Excuse me. Oh. Luke chapter 23, verses 39. Let me move my Bible here. Maybe it might be a little easier. 29 through 43. And again, this is real legitimate Bible study. You look up the verses and you read them and you think about them and discuss them. 39, verse 43. Okay. This is, let me give you a, a little preface of what's going on here. Jesus has been tortured. Um, they have already hung him on the cross. This is the crucifixion part, okay? Verse 39 says, one of the criminals, he had two criminals that were um, on either side of him. He was in the middle and he had somebody on the right and somebody on the left and they were, they were thieves, okay? Thieves and I think that's what it was. Yeah, they were thieves. So verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, rebuked the other criminal. He's like, hey, dude, you know, and they're both, you know, hung on the cross on the other side of Jesus. He says, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, meaning Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered to this criminal, and he said, I tell you the truth. 
today you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> Let's talk about that, okay? Were these guys worthy of heaven? According to the word, no. But none of us are at first. These guys had done crimes that they were guilty of and they knew it. But what happened in that moment when this criminal's talking to Jesus? He rebuked the other criminal. He's like, hey, we've done wrong and we know we've done wrong. But this guy called Jesus didn't do anything wrong. You be quiet. And I mean, that's basically he was standing up for Jesus, which is way cool. I love that. But at the same time, he believed that who was hanging next to him was the real true Messiah. And he was the guy that was there to save him from his sins. And the reason why we know that he believed that is because if you read verse 42, it says, Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew that Jesus was Jesus. And immediately, because he believed, he was saved. Okay? He's literally talking to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being crucified right along next to him in a different way. But it was so monumental, and Jesus knew his heart. That's why I always tell people, God's the judge. God knows your heart. And if you are not legit, he knows. And he knew this guy was legitimate. He knew this guy loved him. And he knew that the guy was sincere about being wanting forgiveness of his sins. He says, I and Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. So did that thief deserve? No. But he had that moment that he believed and his heart changed and that's what changed everything because he believed in Jesus and Jesus immediately wiped out his sins even on the cross that's so cool he's hanging on the cross and he's forgiven this guy because that's what it was all about okay it just excites me so were either of these thieves worthy of heaven no how many good works did this guy have to do he didn't do any good works that's just it. None. We don't have to do good works to get to heaven. You can't do good works to get to heaven. It is grace. You are saved by grace. Okay? So, when did that guy get to go to heaven? The very same day that Jesus did. Same day. Because he had that moment right there. I just, I just love that. That's just awesome. Thank you, Lord. So think about that. You know, think about how you have had your moment with Jesus. One of these days when we're in heaven, we're going to get to meet that criminal, which I don't know what his name, and I shouldn't call him a criminal because he's not anymore. He's saved by grace. One of these days we'll be up there and we'll meet the guy that was next to Jesus and was saved immediately. It's just really cool when I think about it, so... And think about how your relationship with the Lord has affected your daily life. It should. It should change everything for you. And it, it doesn't happen overnight, but it, as you grow in the Lord, it will change your life. Things will change, okay? Okay, well, next week we'll go on to uh, part five. And I don't recall what all those details are at the moment. I think I have it here. Yes. We'll be covering over more scripture, but that's what we'll do the whole time. We'll go over scripture after scripture and dissect it, work on it. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you. I think that's it. So I'll pray and then we'll move on. Lord, I thank you. You are so good. Just sitting and, and thinking about your word is exciting especially when we apply it to our lives. God, help those that need this. Help them have a hunger and thirst for your word, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a hunger and thirst for you, I pray and declare it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good one.
I'll see you next time.